Well, thanks, Brother James, and good morning, my dear brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ. Once more today, we have the opportunity to come together united around the emblems. And we are united, brothers and sisters, by a common hope and a common goal, and that is to be part of those that will make up the saints in the age to come when our Lord Jesus Christ will be here as King. And while we wait, we use moments such as we have today to encourage each other to remain committed to our calling as it is in our Lord Jesus Christ. And our daily readings today have brought us to Psalm 34, which is the middle portion. And Psalm 34 is an intensely interesting and moving Psalm of David. You see, the Psalm of D that David has penned here is based on a very firm incident in his life. David had reached a low point in his life. David had just come off an intense period of where he'd been on the run from Saul, and he had a final meeting with Jonathan, and the two whose souls were knit together in friendship didn't know if they would see each other again. And in chapter 21 of 1 Samuel, we see that David was hungry and with no weapon and in fear of Saul once more. Let's go over to 1 Samuel chapter 21. And we pick up the record in verse 10. We see that David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And this was the point to which David had been driven, that he was on the run again, fear had entered his life, and he decides to go uh, down to the king of Gath. And when he arrives, his troubles just get worse. Because in verse 11, we read, and the servants of Achish said unto him, is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing one to another of him and dance saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands? And verse 12, and David laid up these words in his heart and was so afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So again, we see that David has now gone from being in fear of Saul now to being in fear of Achish. So David really is at a very low point. And in verse 13, we read of his changed behavior. Before them, he feigned himself mad in their hands and scabbled, scrabbled on the doors of the gate and let his spittle fall down upon his beard. And then said Achish unto his servants, Lo, ye see, the man is mad. Wherefore then have he brought him to me? Have I need of a madman? that he brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence. Shall this fellow come into my house? And then in verse 1 of chapter 22, David departed thence and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And some commentators feel that David had some form of mental breakdown at this particular point that caused him to change his behavior. Or maybe he just put on a great act. But whatever it is, brothers and sisters, it causes David to write Psalm 34. And in Psalm 34, David's going to have some wonderful words for us. You see, the psalm that David pens here becomes a psalm of encouragement, as David gives us some very encouraging words to hold on to. When we read the psalm, we very quickly realize that this psalm applies to more than David. It is a psalm about him and his experiences. It's also a psalm whereby we can personally identify with, which, what, with what has been written. And we also very firmly see our Lord Jesus Christ. The psalm deals with coping with fear and afflictions. And it centers our hearts and minds as to where our focus should be. The psalm deals with humility before our God and trying circumstances. You see, David had tried to deal and cope with his own problems and burdens in his own strength, and that had brought him to his low point. And we see in verse 4 of the psalm that he acknowledges that. He says, I sought Yahweh, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. So the inference is that what had happened to him living in fear of Saul and living in fear of Achish means that he may have forgotten to seek his God in prayer. 
and it had caused him to reach an all-time low. And in Nahum chapter 1 verse 7, we read that Yahweh is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. And in verse 22 of Psalm 34, we read, Yahweh redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. And so we see that David had to come back to that point in his life where his trust in his God was completely restored. And this morning, brothers and sisters, I'm sure there's many of us that can identify with David in his day of trouble. You see, if we're completely honest with ourselves, we too are guilty of carrying our own burdens in our own strength and very often to the point of, man of mental anguish. But we do this because we are weak and we are constantly reminded that we need to turn to our God as we read in the Psalm. Now, one of the very key themes here is verse 18. That uh, um, is Chica, if you know, like, if you get the right materials, it is. Um, if we pick up verse 18, it says that Yahweh is nigh unto them that of a broken heart and save such as be of a contrite spirit. And this is really the point that David had got to. And he had to learn that before his God, this is the way that he had to be. And our Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 11 from verse 25, we read, and at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father. No man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. And we have those words of our Lord Jesus Christ being the manifestation of his Father, and that the Father and Son both reveal each other. And it's then that the Lord Jesus Christ says these words, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And when we consider the words of our Lord Jesus Christ in the context of where we have seen David and the, the context where we can see ourselves, we need to understand, brothers and sisters, that in our calling of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ has called us to be unburdened from the things of this world and to take on his yoke. You see, our Lord Jesus Christ gets to the very heart of the matter. In the initial sense, we came to our Lord Jesus Christ burdened by sin with no forgiveness without the covenants of promise. But we have removed the yoke of sin and bondage and replaced it with the yoke of our Lord Jesus Christ, the yoke that he offers. You see, this yoke that our Lord Jesus Christ offers, brothers and sisters, is built on the principles of, meek, of meekness and being of a lowly heart. It's a yoke of learning from him. And furthermore, it's a yoke that is easy and a burden that is light. So when we set the yoke of bondage of sin and death alongside the yoke of our Lord Jesus Christ, we very quickly realize that the yoke of our Lord Jesus Christ is light and it is not a burden. You see, when we come to verse 6 to 8 of Psalm 34, we learn that our Lord Jesus Christ cried to his father and his father heard him. This poor man cried and Yahweh heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Verse 7, the angel of Yahweh encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. O taste and see that Yahweh is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ had learnt, brothers and sisters, that everything in his life was from his father and that his father would save him from all troubles. In verse 7, we are taken right into the center of our Lord Jesus Christ's life, who had angels encamping around him. And so do we. And we also see him here 
in the garden of Gethsemane, an angel sustaining him in his darkest hour. And then in verse 17, we read the righteous cry and Yahweh heareth and delivereth them out of all their troubles. You see, our Lord Jesus Christ had to learn to cast his burden upon the father because he could do no else. And in verse 8, he had tasted and seen that his father is good and blessed is the man that trusts in him. And then in verse 18 of the psalm, we see that Yahweh is nigh to them that are of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And here we see our Lord Jesus Christ before his father. And that's why he could say, I am meek and lowly in heart. Because our Lord Jesus Christ had learned from very early on that he needed to be about his father's business. And there was no way that our Lord Jesus Christ would have run the victory over sin and death had he tried to do it in his own strength. Just like David had learned, our, da our Lord had learned, we need to learn that there can be no victory of sin and death in our own strength. We need to take on that yoke of our Lord that is light and easy. And our problem, brothers and sisters, is so often we try to carry both yokes when we turn to our own strength and our own solutions. And our challenge is to learn to set aside the yoke that burdens. And taking on the yoke of our Lord Jesus Christ takes on many lessons for us for our walk in the truth. One of the concerns that I currently have, brothers and sisters, is the ecclesia in the days in which we are living, not only here in Pinetown, but also worldwide. Lockdown has brought about a set of circumstances that is interfering with the very core principles of ecclesial life. And somehow we need to make sure that we remain focused on the things that we ought to be about. You see, in taking on the yoke of our Lord Jesus Christ in baptism, we all take on the yoke of ecclesial responsibility. This yoke is not for some, it's for all of us. So often we can see ecclesial responsibility as a burden, just another chore, something else that needs our attention in a really busy schedule. But in reality, brothers and sisters, ecclesial life should never be seen as a burden. Ecclesial duties should never weigh heavily upon us because they are based upon a yoke that is light. Ecclesial life and duties become a heavy burden when we lay upon it another spirit other than that of meekness and being of a lowly heart. When personal wants and desires are imposed on each other, that's when the things of the truth become a burden. For many of us here online this morning, brothers and sisters, we are approaching a year that we haven't been together in person. And this brings with the challenges that we haven't ever really dealt with before. And one of the dangers that exists is that we can become insular and very inward looking in our approach. Over many years, we have built relationships by seeing each other and we fostered those. And we really need to think hard on a personal level how we can maintain those relationships and build them despite what's going on. Currently via Zoom, we run a slightly reduced format from what usually happens on a Sunday. And so we need to ask how we can fulfill our levels of service that are required of us despite what's going on. Many of the things that we have been actively involved in over the years are not happening. So we need to think for a minute or two about what we can do. If we think about the duty of a doorman, the duty of the doorman is to be outward looking, to be welcoming and warm towards those that arrive at the hall, to have a spirit of perception, to see if someone is burdened as they find out if everything is okay. So maybe we all need to adopt the spirit of the doorman while on Zoom and take notice of those that may not be on or who not who don't seem to be themselves and put a meaningful phone call in afterwards to find out how they are. And we need to make the call, not to wait for the call. And the same can be said for the attendance register. We all need to take note of those that are there and those who are not. 
if we haven't seen that someone has been on Zoom for a week or two, make the call. Don't think that somebody else is going to be doing it. You see, there's currently no tea duties. There's no sharing of meals at fraternals. Tea duty and meal preparation has never been about the food, but the principles of service and of fellowship. So right now, while this is not happening, we can look out for those that are sick, for those that are unemployed and make sure that they have food. This is living the yoke of service to each other in love and kindness. Praise and worship is something we are missing. The pleasure of singing together in a hall in praise, even if you don't have the best voice, is a highlight for each one of us. So if you have a musical talent, find a song and send it to someone who's struggling. Receiving a hymn in the middle of the day is enough to brighten anybody's day. There is currently a WhatsApp group called the Hallelujah Group that's already trying to do this. If you wish to be added to it, send your name to Sister Cheryl. Our formal gospel proclamation is no longer happening like it was. No lectures, no pine crest, no seminars. And the time has come for us to consider or reconsider our gospel proclamation efforts. And while that is happening, we all can do little things. A word in season to someone outside the fold may make them think why we are not driven by fear during this pandemic. People we meet should be able to see that we have sought Yahweh and that he's delivered us from all our fears, as we read in verse 4 of, of Psalm 34. A well-worded WhatsApp status or Facebook status may cause someone to think and ask us why we put that up. We can also add links to the Ecclesial website and Ecclesial Facebook page. So it's just redirecting the way we think about these things, brothers and sisters, to make sure that we are fulfilling them in some shape or form. We are not seeing our members' children in person. And our children have also felt this period of isolation very keenly, I'm sure. But the Simon is the new Sunday school superintendent this year. And if you feel that you can offer a Zoom lesson or two, please tell him. Or if you come across material that will help our young ones remain focused, please send it to him. There's also a WhatsApp group for the children if you want to send a message of encouragement, please send it on to myself or Simon and we'll post it on there. Our children need to know that we care about them. There is currently the daily readings class on the Sunday morning and now also on a Tuesday evening. This is a wonderful opportunity to read together and to discuss matters of the truth. A few minutes beforehand of preparation will allow us to make some meaningful contribution. If you don't feel you want to say anything, ask a question in the chat function. And none of these things, brothers and sisters, that we have spoken about ought to be seen as a burden. They really need to just be who we are. In all this, we need to make sure that there is a people that is ready and prepared when our Lord Jesus Christ returns. And the longer the period of isolation drags on, the more important it is good for us to think about these things. You see, one of the things that lockdown has done is allowed each of us to really nurture our relationship with our Heavenly Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason is because everything that we considered normal has been turned on its head. And it's only really by knowing God and his son that we prevailed. We, however, need to make sure that that relationship now spills over to each other. You see, brothers and sisters, none of the things that we've spoken about are without merit because our Lord Jesus Christ bore the same yoke. He also bore the yoke of service to the very end. He showed what it meant to serve one another as he knelt to wash the disciples' feet. He was moved with compassion as he looked out for those in need and fed the hungry. This morning in Matthew's reading, we see that he suffered the little children to come to him. And at every turn, he preached the kingdom. And the lesson of serving with the yoke of Christ is further enhanced when we understand what David says in the psalm. You see, in verse 1, he says that praise belongs to Yahweh and is given to him continually on our lips. Because in verse 2, he says we boast in Yahweh. 
that's not a boasting in our own abilities, but we understand that all praise and glory is due to him. We lift Yahweh up to his rightful place because we serve him with a humble and a contrite heart. You see, brothers and sisters, the lifting up of our heavenly father to his rightful place can only be done if we are in the right place before him. We are reminded of what Hebrews 10 says, that we are able to approach with boldness the throne of grace. Not our, not our own boldness, not our own strength, but boldness in our Lord Jesus Christ who's opened the way. And then in verse 3, he carries on to say, O oh, magnify Yahweh with me, let us exalt his name together. And here we see where it all comes together. Something that starts with being personal between God, David and God now becomes a collective effort. Together, O oh, magnify Yahweh with me, let us exalt his name together. You see, Christ opened the way of life and we belong to that glorious body which has been established. To exalt God is to lift him up, to put him in his rightful place. You see, and when we seek him, brothers and sisters, he in turn delivers us in verse 4. And that word deliver means to pluck up. And because we've lifted him up, he plucks us up, brothers and sisters, out of our circumstances if we approach him in the right way. And there's also a very deep lesson about prayer in this psalm. In verse 6, we have this poor man cried or called out and Yahweh heard him. And then in verse 15, the eyes of Yahweh upon the righteous and his ears are open unto their cry. In verse 17, the righteous cry and Yahweh heareth and delivereth them out of all their troubles. And we see here that there's a change. It goes from the poor man who cried to the righteous man crying. And we see that our relationship with our Heavenly Father that begins in verse 6 as someone that needs deliverance from sin and death changes to one of us being seen as someone who is righteous in his eyes because of faith. And so we call out to him, brothers and sisters, knowing initially of our need of salvation. And then because he sees us as righteous, we can cry to him daily. You see, Psalm 18 and at verse 6 says, In my distress, I called upon Yahweh and cried unto my God, and he heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him, even into his ears. And if you read the Psalms and you look for the number of times that the Psalms use this analogy about God hearing prayer, it really does motivate us to be involved in prayer with our Heavenly Father. In the New Testament, in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18, we read that our Lord Jesus Christ is able to succor us now. That means that he's able to run to our aid or to our cry. Because it says he being tempted is able to succor us because he understands our plight. The very one whose yoke is light and whose burden is light is with us every step of the way after we put it on. You see, our Lord Jesus Christ hasn't asked us to put the yoke on and then just leave us to our own devices. It is his yoke, and he is with us every step of the way. And so verse 15 reminds us that God looks out for us in the midst of the turmoil of life that we currently have had turned up a few notches. God is there. Let us remember whose we are. And let us remember that he sees and that he hears. And then in verse 19, we come to see specifically our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the psalm changes in language here. Now goes from the plural to the singular. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but Yahweh delivereth him out of them all. He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. And we really see our Lord Jesus Christ here. We see him here as the one who's asked us to wear his yoke. We see him as the one who suffered many afflictions. If we pause for a moment here at this verse, 
and meditate on what our Lord Jesus Christ endured so that we can be saved, we begin to realize what a great price was paid for our salvation as we comprehend that its afflictions were many. In the Garden of Gethsemane, we see him in his final moments of afflictions before being tried and crucified. And here the angel of the Yahweh encamped around him as his cry reached the Father's ear. And we are reminded of Psalm, so of Isaiah 53. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows acquainted with grief and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet did we esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and Yahweh hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. And so as we come to remember him now, brothers and sisters, in the bread and wine, let us do so with a renewed spirit, a renewed spirit to put on the yoke of humility and service, to look out for our brothers and sisters, to understand that our Heavenly Father is looking out for us. And this morning, as we partake of the bread and the wine, let us taste and see that Yahweh is indeed good. Amen.